perfect in every way. behind us and you hem us in from side to side. Isn't that a beautiful thought, y'all? Love you, Jesus. You can have a seat. I was here last night for Trunk or Treat as we had well over a hundred folks come and participate in a wonderful evening. And I want to thank our children's ministry director, uh, Molly. Molly's right here. So thank you, Molly, for organizing that. And uh, this is time in our service where we dismiss any kids that are here uh, for Creek Kids, which we meet downstairs in the basement. So if you'll go with Miss Molly, she would love to have you.
Loving that Misty Creek shirt right there? Yes. And as they make their way out, we want to welcome you to Misty Creek Community Church. My name is Stephen Street, and I am the senior pastor here. Uh, Doug Allen is our worship pastor in this phenomenal worship team. Uh, the Holy Spirit is really bringing it through this morning. And the evidence of His goodness is all over your faces this morning that you are here and watching online. And for those who are outside uh, braving the misty weather out there, we're at Misty Creek, so it makes sense, doesn't it? So we're, we're glad you're here. Um, just a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. Um, you may have gotten this handout when you came in today, or maybe it was in your seat. If not, let me just highlight a couple of things here. Uh, there is a missions team meeting today. Um, Lisa Nimitz is our missions coordinator, and that will be at, um, right after the church service, and it will be out under the tent there. So if you're on the missions team or you're interested in being a part of our missions team, we'd love to have you be a part of that. And speaking of missions, I want to welcome back John and Anastasia Pass. Um, they were down in Punta Gorda, Florida, and they were doing hurricane relief work with Samaritan's Purse, and they took a van load, I mean a van load of donations from our church and the community here, including the hurricane blessing bags that our teenagers put together. So thank you for doing that and for your service there, and uh, I look forward to meeting with them and hearing all about their experience and then sharing that with the congregation as well. So missions team today, right after the service, you have a meeting. Uh, there's no run for God um, this evening. Our next men's Bible study is coming up. So men, uh, we will begin uh, on November 7th at 7 p.m. We're going to be doing a study of Philippians. And so I know you'll want to be a part of that. And last but not least, Samaritan's Purse. I think we have about 20 boxes left um, out of 100. So that's great. And so your deadline to bring those boxes back will be November 6th. So if you didn't already get a box or you want another one um, for Operation Christmas Child, pick one up at our welcome station before you leave. And if this is your first time with us, please stop by one of our welcome stations. We would love to greet you and tell you more about this amazing worshiping community. I'm so thankful you're here. May God bless you. And by the way, missions is so important in our church that um, we have a special presentation today. Lisa, where are you? There she is, and I'm going to have Lisa Nimitz if she would come forward now. Lisa represented Misty Creek on a mission team to Ecuador and uh, part of an organization that she um, was with. Right there, Lisa. Uh, Jungle Kids for Christ, and she's going to share that, um, that experience with you. So if you'll give Lisa your undivided attention for a few moments. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, let's get that. Oh. I'm so excited that I finally get to share this trip with you. Um, I was honored to go on this trip and very grateful to be able to represent Misty Creek. Um, I felt every single one of your prayers, and I can't tell you how much it meant to me. There were times that I'd never been to a, um, inter on an international mission trip before. I'd never been to South America. And of course, there were things in South America I was not accustomed to. So when, uh, you know, we had to do tarantula checks on the ceiling and things like that before bed. I, all I kept saying was, my church has got me. My church is praying for me. I'll be fine. And it was. Nothing happened. So thank you for that. Um, so one of the reasons I went to Misuwahi, Ecuador, um, we wanted to see if Jungle Kids for Christ would be the kind of organization that we would like to partner with. Um, to add to the domestic missions work we're doing here in the U.S., we were looking for a potential partner to do international um, support. So I'll just tell you real quickly um, how we got to know Jungle Kids for Christ and why we thought it would be important to go. Um, during a missions team meeting, we were introduced to a Jungle Kids for Christ board member whose name is Al McConnell, and he's a close family friend of the um, Street family. Um, he is on the board. He absolutely loves Jungle Kids for Christ. And um, they, set, they put together a presentation for the missions team to talk with Al. And we FaceTimed or Skyped with the, um, the missionaries that were there and talked to us about the work that they're doing um, at Antioch Christian Academy in the jungle. Um, Stephen had asked us to prayerfully consider after the presentation to pray about our church going and possible, the possibility of putting a team together to go, and I didn't even need to pray on it. I told Stephen right after the service, um, I'm going. So I had absolutely no doubt that God wanted us to see what he was doing there. So we started with a group of four or five folks from Misty Creek. 
um, we, that were interested. We attended monthly trip planning meetings and you know, after a while some uh, trip conflicts and fall planning and things started to arise and God put other things on people's plates, um, I ended up being the lone survivor. And actually I was happy to do that because the team that I was put together with was awesome. So let me just tell you quickly a little bit about the team. So um, there were eight of us, all representing different churches, um, and most of the churches were looking um, for this trip to be a vision trip, like we were, to go down there and see if it was something that we could you know, bring a larger group to and um, maybe prayerfully consider partnering with in the future. Um, so, Well, I guess at this point, Eric, we're going to start. So this is us starting, entering the city of Quito. So we boarded a bus for six hours after we landed, and we ended up traveling all through Baños and into the jungle of Ecuador. We started at 9,000 feet up in Quito, and it was quite cool. And by the time we got to the jungle, it was like 90. Um, these are kind of the, the scenes that we passed along the way. There were a lot of people um, living in traditional tin roof homes, a lot of beautiful scenery. We got to stop and see some beautiful falls and they farm going up. Okay, Eric, can we stop it right here, please? Uh, they, they farm, uh, they do a lot of terrace farming in the mountains, it's beautiful. Um, so be, because we were traveling into the jungle, we had an opportunity to stop at a few places. This was one of the key stops we made. It's called the Saint House. And it um, used to house some of the first missionaries that went to Ecuador. Um, there's a movie called The End of the Spear that depicts the story of the Saint family and the four other missionary families that went down there and their desire to bring the gospel to the jungle, what happened to them, and basically how we're continuing the work that they started. So that was a pretty amazing um, opportunity to go to, to be in the place where they were. Um, Jim Saint was a, um, a pilot, and he used to fly around and was determined to, fi to figure out like how he could bring Jesus to the jungle. And there was a group of people um, known as the Rwani that he, he was determined to reach. So he started dropping gifts for them out of the plane. And there was a basket with a rope, and they'd come and get the gifts, and then they'd start returning gifts. And he, they were trying to kind of um, figure out if they were safe, if they were friendly. Um, so I would highly recommend watching The End of the Spear there is a, a biblical relation to it that I will get to later, but that was um, one of the highlights of coming into the jungle. Okay, thank you, Eric. So we were welcomed by the locals when we got into Misawai. And that night we just kind of walked around the town and got our bearings. We got set up in the hostel, which was lovely. It was an open air Hostel, um, no air conditioning, hottest place I've ever been in my life, but it was awesome. So the next day, we um, headed to Antioch Christian Academy, and we were ready to get started. Um, the school was started, Eric, let's just stop here for one second. So the school was started Years ago, there was a family called the Dav named the Davalos, which they're still the Davalos. Anyway, um, Roberto and Charme Davalos were missionaries that came to the jungle, and Mrs. Davalos was actually homeschooling her kids in their little house. Um, and the local family started noticing and came to Mrs. Davalos and said, will you teach our kids too? Because she not only was teaching them um, homeschooling them in academics. She was homeschooling them in the Bible. Uh, the only problem was for the people that wanted to be homeschooled, she only taught in English. So if the kids were to come, they had to, come, they had to be taught in English, which they were. 
Um, that kind of started, that was the root of Antioch Christian Academy, and it has grown to over 200 kids. So this was us kind of getting a tour of the campus. Um, I need to sort of explain a little bit about this team. I'll, I'll get to it a little further, but the man in the white hat, his name is Rod Frazier. Um, he was the t one of our team members from UMC of Cumming. And it, there's an interesting story. The, um, the man standing, uh, talking with us, his name is Tyler Foster. And Tyler used to be a kid in Rod Frazier's youth group years ago. And not only was he a kid in the youth group, but Rod's daughter, Kaylin, was also in the youth group. And they did this trip as kids. Now, Kaylin and Tyler are married. They're living in the jungle. They are running the school. And they're in charge of bringing missionaries in. Um, so if you see a baby in any of these photos, and you're wondering, why is there a baby in the jungle? Who brought a baby? They had the baby there. So um, just, a, just a little background on like how long this has been going. And this is not a one and done type of mission trip. This is the kind of thing where there's an investment, there's a relationship that's been built. And um, you know that's something I hope God desires of, of us through, through Antioch Christian Academy. Um, so the, the school ranges from, from preschool to high school. And on the campus, there's a residence house for girls. So I think we're going to get to the residence house in just a minute. But let me just tell you that there are, some, there are five girls that had to travel so far to go to school that it was just impossible, that they couldn't possibly make the trip every day. They have to get on a boat. They have to go down the river. So a residence house was established. And um, there's about five girls living there now with five to six missionary women, um, which includes Al McConnell's daughter. The, the, he's on the trip with us. He's the one that kind of introduced us to Jungle Kids for Christ. And his daughter was um, had graduated, wasn't quite ready for school, and decided to take a gap year. And Al sent her to the jungle. So she's been living with these girls and providing a family structure during the week. The girls go home on the weekends. And during the week, they're living at a residence um, house with um, all these lovely missionary women. So we can continue from here. And that's the residence house they live in. And right now, there's only a residence house for the girls. And I know that at some point, they're going to want to, OK, let's stop right there. They're going to want to um, you know, build one for the boys, too, because there's definitely some boys that have to travel very far to, to get to school and um, could use the same sort of setup. Um, just as a, an opportunity to show you how far some of these kids have to go to school and how much they appreciate, appreciate the school, I want to show you one of the girls that lives in the residence house. Um, this is Lillian's journey that she does every single weekend. resident home at the Antioch Christian Academy was established in 2016 with the vision of providing a secured, disciplined, family-oriented home to indigenous girls who are undervalued and unable to attain a good education in their communities. This structured environment ministers to their physical, educational, emotional, and spiritual needs. The girls come from an area of the world that is incredibly unique. There are over 40,000 types of plants, 1,300 bird species, 3,000 fish species, and 2.5 million different insects. There's the Quechua people group whom have their own authorities and language. 
social responsibility, and nature respect are values that these communities live by. One of the most important parts of the girls' social and emotional development is to reaffirm their family structure. It's imperative that when they are in their own community, they grow and fit in their own environment. It's difficult not to sympathize for the girls who leave their families every week for this opportunity. Though their sacrifice is not in the separation from their families, but in the journey to and from. Hours of taxi rides, canoes, and hiking stand between the girls and their education. But this venture is deemed necessary for the chance to bring value to knowledge and information back into the community. We yearn that they reconnect with their homes and someday be the ones that bring the gospel farther than we can ever reach. The student home and their education is only a small part of what God has planned for these girls' lives. The impact they have in their families and community is just the beginning. If this journey doesn't stop them, nothing will. Please consider becoming a part of a student's life. A part that will help us see one of these girls make a difference in the Amazon jungle. One of the points I wanted to highlight um, that was mentioned here is that as missionaries, we are not coming to change what they're doing as far as like, we're not there to Americanize them. We're not there to change their culture. We are there to bring the gospel to them. And so it's very important that when they're in the communities at the school and then they're sent home, that they're encouraged you know, to, to blend back in with their culture. We're not trying to change them. Um, so that's just one girl's you know, journey to get to school every day. Um, and that was a village um, called <clears throat> Beja Vista. And we're, we're, we actually <clears throat> go to that village and we, we basically um, experience Lillian's journey every day. But we did it with suitcases full of supplies. Um, Eric, if you wanna continue. Oh. And get to the the basketballs. So one of the things that we were asked to do as we were planning, um, as you can see, it's a five hour, four hour ride into the jungle. There's It's a port city. There's a lot of boats to get places. It's not easy to get things there. So when missionaries come, they ask us to bring supplies and they have an incredible basketball program that they started and they asked us to bring um, Basketballs, these are the basketballs, they were deflated. So we had, we each had like three carry-ons with um, supplies for the school, for the missionaries, basketballs, whatever they asked us to bring, we brought. We also, Misty Creek supplied um, Bibles in Spanish for them. And so the other thing that we were asked to do was to provide a career fair at the high school, or at the school for the high school kids. So, um, the next, the first morning we were there, the mornings were, were filled with career fairs, their career fair in the morning, and basically they were trying to give the kids opportunities to interact and ask questions in English, um, their sophomores to seniors in high school about career opportunities as they graduate and go to college. We had a vet tech, we had, um, I did, did one on being a, media, being a meteorologist. We had a school counselor, let's just stop here for one second, a computer programmer, and the kids went around and talked to each of us about um, certain job opportunities. After that, we were asked to do a Bible study, and we were asked to um, do a lesson on biblical decision-making with the teens. So we chose the um, proverb 1320, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Uh, we did some icebreaker games with the kids and kind of got to know them, and then we had an activity. Um, we talked about what happens when um, you are with a group of people, and you may not be doing anything wrong, but 
just by being nearby, you may get the shrapnel of someone else's decisions all over you. So we demonstrated this by putting a giant watermelon on a table. We gave one lucky young man a sledgehammer and provided some protective umbrellas, thanks to the Weather Channel, and they s smashed the watermelon. And they smashed it, and they smashed it, and it spread all over their friends. So we, just, we talked about putting up guardrails in our lives, um, walking with wise people, walking to make decisions, and what happens um, when you, you know, are, are not walking with the wise and can suffer if you're walking with, um, within the company of fools. So we did the career fair every morning, then we did the Bible lesson, and we, we did it with like four different groups of kids. Um, after that, I'll tell you what though, kids are kids everywhere. Like smashing of the watermelon, they were so excited, they were running around trying to eat it, we were trying to get them all cleaned up and go to lunch. But um, even in the jungle, teens are teens. Um, so, okay, we can move on to that. The next morning we were um, invited to a special ceremony, uh, keeping in mind that because this school is so small, this is the first graduating class they will ever have, or they, they've had. And so there was a special ceremony where the seniors um, come together with their families, they're given a flag, they're, they're given a sash, and they basically um, pledge allegiance to the flag of Ecuador. And it's, it's very, very special, and it's only for seniors. So being that this was the, the first senior class, it was quite a special thing to be invited to and be part of. Um, and so that was really cool. Um, so then in the afternoons, we did um, work on, well, we did work on the property. So our afternoons would be either helping to um, facilitate the basketball clinic, we read books to the girls, we organized a library full of reading materials for the teachers. Anything they asked us to do, we did it. We painted gutters, we hauled wheelbarrows full of rocks and dirt and whatever they needed us to do. And then every afternoon, we always had an opportunity to fellowship and hang out with the kids and play with them, which was the best part. They were so sweet and so grateful. And it was just a lovely opportunity to just try to connect with them and play, and and that's Brenna, that's Al McConnell's daughter, the one that's a, that took her gap year to be a missionary there, and lives with the girls, and that's Al, that's her dad. So, oh, okay, let's stop here for one second. So in, in addition, I know this is probably going on forever, um, in addition to us coming down there and serving them. Um, part of the funds of going on the trip provided a sponsorship for one of the students for tuition. And this is Cabillo, and he is, um, we, Misty Creek, and along with the five other churches, we came in together with funding, and we are sponsoring this young man's tuition. So we got to meet him. He was very, very grateful. And additionally, there are um, opportunities to sponsor kids personally, and the two, um, the couple on the left, Catherine and Bob, um, got to meet their two little kids. Eric, we can keep going from here. Thank you. Um, so they got to meet the kids that they've been sponsoring all these years, which was super, super special. So just, you know, afternoons, meeting up with the kids and talking to them. Um, speaking English is very, very important. So when there's somebody on campus, um, they really want us to speak English with them, and all of them spoke English to us. That's kind of a, a goal when they graduate, but these kids couldn't have been friendlier. Every time I was on campus, it was like, hello, ma'am, hello, ma'am. They were lovely and grateful. And then this is pretty much what we did most afternoons when we had the hour to ourselves. Because <laughs> going back to our rooms was not an option. It was like going back to a sauna. 
So um, on day four of the trip, we were done at the school, and it was our turn to take Lillian's journey into the jungle to visit um, her community. And we were asked to bring um, a s snacks for the kids, games. We were, we were basically going to do a, a day camp for all the kids in the community in Beja Vista, which was an hour boat ride in with all of our supplies. We had suitcases full of everything, drinks, snacks. Um, funny enough, uh, it's the rainforest, but it didn't rain at all. So while we were there, the rivers were very low, and the port where we were getting out of the canoe to get to the village was actually all dried up. So we had to walk for further than we normally would, and the whole village came running to grab suitcases and snacks and like everything to, to welcome us into the village. And then um, there we met Pastor Ramirez, Ramirez, who is the minister for this little sweet town. And we just spent the day loving on these kids. We were asked to provide a day camp and also include a Bible lesson. So we made flags with the kids. We played games. We ran around with them. And the parents, too, uh, provided a snack. And then um, we did a Bible study on, that's, uh, that's their little church, and that was choir practice. They were singing while we were playing. Um, Pastor Ramirez had asked us to do a Bible lesson on what it means to be free from sin through Jesus. So we ended up getting a giant box and filling it with the heaviest rocks we could. Let's just pause right there, Eric. Um, and we passed it around to the kids and to the parents and had this, you know, giant box of rocks that they were passing to one another. And then we talked with them about how it felt to finally let go of those rocks and not have to carry that around and that Jesus is the one that takes that burden from us. Um, and we had, because those kids don't speak English at all, we had a translator and just tried to keep it very simple. But I think we got the message across in a fun way. And um, it was, it was a, a really, really special day. Um, that evening was gonna be our last day in the jungle. They prepared a special meal for us. Eric, we can keep going from here. And they were very, very excited because they had a special delicacy um, that they had prepared for us, which were roasted grubs, which was something different. They, it actually tasted like roasted sausage. It wasn't terrible. So um, we board the bus, head back to Quito. We stop along the way um, just to see oh. some more of Banos. Okay, let's stop right here for one second. And these are our tour guides that took us all around. This girl is Marisol. Marisol is the adopted daughter of the Davalos that started the little school family. I mean, the little family home school. She, was, she ended up being adopted by them. She's now 25 years old, and she's going to um, college in Quito. And that's her sweet little boyfriend, Dennis. And they jumped on the bus with us and gave us a tour of Quito. And it was just so amazing to see this little girl from the jungle, how she had blossomed into this beautiful young lady and going to college, but her roots are in Misawaii and she is still like working with Antioch Christian Academy and just excited to share um, everything that she's learned and also keep, you know, her culture and the, um, the love she has for her town intact. Okay, so we can keep going from there. So it was it was a real pleasure to kind of meet her and see the product. Um, There's a lot of cacao, a lot of cacao plants in Ecuador, and we uh, were able to go to a chocolate tasting factory. We went to a basilica on the way out, on the way to the airport, which was stunning. And then they took us for one final dinner, and this was our view um, overlooking the city. And so that is until we meet again in Quechua, which is the, um, the native language of the indigenous people there. So I probably went a little over, but um, so what's next? I'm glad you asked. Um, Stephen and I have been in touch with uh, Jungle Kids for Christ, and we asked them to set aside a week for us that we could plan to come back with a, a group from Misty Creek, and um, they have, we've locked in a date of July 16th through, 20, through the 23rd, of this coming July. 
So our plan is, God willing, to go back to the jungle with the group. And the kids won't be there, of course, because it'll be summer break. But we can provide a week-long VBS and basketball clinics and provide an out outreach program for not only the kids at the school, but also in the area. Um, so we, our hope is to bring a group of youth and adults with us. Um, about 12 people, we're gonna keep it small because it, it kind of, it gets arduous kind of all the travel. Um, and additionally, we have an opportunity as a church or as individuals um, to support the basketball program, the student sponsorships um, through the JKC website. You can take a look at that and um, just pray over our trip planning and discernment um, if it's God's will for Misty Creek to have an ongoing partnership with Jungle Kids for Christ, um, there's, a, there's a lot of need out there. And it's not just in Ecuador. There's mission trips all over the place. And there's a need here. So we're doing our part to make sandwiches and to, to do what we can to serve here. And our, our hope is to, for God to lead us to, to serve somewhere internationally. It might be Jungle Kids for Christ. It might be somewhere else. Um, so just... Uh, Thank you for giving me your time. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. It was amazing. Um, I'll be going back in July, and I can't wait to see um, who God taps on the shoulder to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Let's stand together, continue our worship. Interesting little fact about Ecuador. They actually filmed part of Jurassic Park there, for real. Did you see any dinosaurs on your trip? That would be a wild mission trip. Well, let me pray for us, and we're going to continue our worship now. Jesus, thank you for your love that comes after us, that pursues us, that woos us into the family of God, a love that stops at nothing to find and to redeem us. There is no darkness where you won't shine your light, Lord. There, there's no mountain that you won't climb up to find us. There's no wall that you won't kick down. There's no lie from hell that you won't dismantle and tear down to save us. Leaving the 99 sheep for the one may seem foolish and illogical until we are the one. And we've all been the one. Lord, you are Yahweh, the sovereign Lord God Almighty. You are El Olam, the everlasting God. You are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals and Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. You are El Shaddai, God Almighty, and you are El Royi, the God who sees us. You never give up on us, and you'll never stop loving us. This love may seem reckless to some, but this is your very heart to seek and save the lost. For you are Savior and Messiah and Redeemer and Comforter, Counselor and Friend. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, let it be so, Lord. Amen. Do 
scripture is Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are often like Zacchaeus, making huge efforts to catch a glimpse of you, only to find that you are waiting for us, calling us by name, and inviting yourself into our hearts. Thank you for seeking and for saving us. Thank you for the amazing love and grace you have bestowed upon us. Thank you for forgiving our sins and for bringing salvation into our hearts. Help us, Lord, to become more aware that we are at all times and in all places in your loving presence. Help us to realize that the divine is in us and in every person that we meet. And this includes those whom we may find difficult. Heavenly Father, show us those that we may be treating like Zacchaeus. Allow us to see them as you do, so that we may show them the love and acceptance that you have shown each and every one of us. Give us a passion for the lost, that we might recognize those whom you have prepared to receive you. Give us a love for the lost, that we might engage them at their point of need with your loving kindness. Give us clarity with the lost, that we might speak into their lives your good news leading them to repentance and redemption. Father God, keep us humble in heart, meek in spirit, and submissive to your Holy Spirit so that we may be used to your greater glory in all that we say and do. In your son's holy and precious name, we pray. Amen.
from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, church. Thank you, worship team, for leading us today. And I know you're wondering, man, it's like 1130. Is he going to preach today? Let me just go ahead and say this. Um, you're going to hear uh, a sermon from God and what he wants you to hear. And if you need to leave today, if you've got appointments this afternoon, uh, feel free to do that. But I want to encourage you to stay and hear what the Lord has to say. And I really want to thank uh, Lisa um, for representing Misty Creek. It's a sacrifice to go on a trip like that. Sacrifice of time, finances, being with family. 
And obviously, uh, God manifested himself through her and that team. And you see the glorious work that God did there. And I hope you're inspired, whether you decide to go on a trip like this or not, to pray for the future team that will go and, and pray how we might support Jungle Kids for Christ moving forward. So thank you, Lisa. We love you. You're awesome. And I, I, I just have to thank Mary Nell for that anointed prayer this morning. I mean, she covered all the goodness of God. I mean, it was, it was powerful. And I'm so proud of her husband. Um, for you men, I'm just going to be honest, men, that missed our six-week men's Bible study on Psalms and the testimonies that were shared every week, I'm going to be, t- be honest, you missed something. It may be, I think it was, the best Bible study I've ever attended. And I've been a pastor for 30 years um, and the testimonies were just transformational. And you talk about the goodness of God that Doug and the mission, uh, the worship team were singing. And uh, didn't Karen do a beautiful job on that? I mean, she's my wife, of course, but um, I was just worshiping her. I'm trying to video her, and I'm shaking because I'm worshiping. Um, the goodness of God is so evident. And, and Tommy's testimony on Monday night um, was just wow is the word. Um, and I saw um, in this chapel and outside the doors of this chapel, as we had a a service of Holy Communion together, a time of surrendering our our burdens, um, our sins, um, our struggles, to see those men uh, write down those struggles and those things in their life that are separating them from being who God created them to be, and to burn those, they burned them right out there. Um, It was one of the most powerful, sacred moments I've ever been a part of. And so, men... I just hope and pray that you will make room for about an hour and a half to two hours every Monday evening to join us for that study. And women, from what I'm hearing, the women's Bible study is on fire. I'm literally on fire with the Holy Spirit and what's happening through the chosen study and the other studies that they're doing. And so we're going to be talking about Zacchaeus today. Now, most of you who have uh, grew up in the church, if you did grow up in the church, you know who Zacchaeus is. Several of you don't. But you might remember that song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. Okay, well, there's, there's a story behind that, and I'm going to share it with you, and I'm, I'm going to ask to Lord, the Lord to hide me behind the cross this morning and just speak what he wants to speak in this message. And Eric, you'll see I'm not going to use all the slides and everything today. Um, it's just what God wants us to do. Um, but Zacchaeus had lived a life of criticism. You see, tax collectors, tax collectors and he was a tax collector, um, in that culture, and still this day, uh, were hated, <laughs> despised, uh, because many of them were corrupt. Not only were they gathering taxes for the Roman Empire and for the religious authorities, the temple taxes, they were also keeping a little bit for themselves in some cases. And so whether they were just doing their job or not, people just thought they were horrible and that they were, they were conniving. And if you're doing the chosen study, one of the primary characters in that study is Matthew. And Matthew was presented that way. Uh, and in that particular um, series, Matthew also appears to have a, a, a social disability, if you've watched it at all. And so he's hated. He has family issues. He has personal issues. And Jesus calls him. To be a disciple. And so I want to start out this morning asking you a a, a question. What criticisms are you most likely to hear from the people who know you best? And do you appreciate it? Do you look forward to it? Is that something that thrills you? Probably not. Do they say, gosh, he's always running late. Or you're too uptight about being early. You know, or you're a penny pincher. Or... You know, you overspend. Very few of us handle criticism graciously, even from people who know and love us. A famous humorist once wrote, Honest criticism is hard to take, particularly from a relative, a friend, an acquaintance, or a stranger. And he's right. Criticism is hard to take, especially when it's unwarranted. You know who Winston Churchill is? He served as prime minister of the United Kingdom during World War II. And he was very well respected for that time. He still is today by many of us. And so during World War II, he was an amazing leader during that time. But in the later years of his life, 
rumors of health problems caused a lot of trouble. One evening he was attending some official function and two men a few rows behind him began speculating about his health. One man said to the other, that's Winston Churchill. They said he must be senile. They say he should step down and let a younger man run the government. They say that he's over the hill. At the end of the program, Churchill turned and scowled at the men and said, they also say Churchill is going deaf. We don't think that Jesus had a hearing problem. He knew that he was the target of criticism. And if you're ever going to represent the gospel and the cause of Christ, you will be a target of criticism. It's going to happen. People will say things about you, gossip about you, speculate about you. It's going to happen, folks, at some point in your ministry, because you're part of a ministry. You're called, you're equipped to be the saints of God. You're a minister as much as I am. And a lot of ministers wouldn't say that, but you are. He's called you and he's equipping you to be his servants, to be his saints. And you better bet Jesus was receiving some criticism. And what was the number one criticism people had about Jesus It was this, that he liked to hang out with sinners. Thank God that's the case because I'm the chief of sinners. And if you're not a sinner, then the doors are open for you to head on out because you're already ready to enter in the pearly gates, folks, if you're not. Even Paul said, I am the chief amongst sinners. And we look at Paul as the greatest apostle of all time. Yet he saw himself, not just his past, not just his past, of persecuting Christians, but he saw himself as being a man, a man of flesh and blood. And he too, like many of the men at the Bible study, had a thorn in his flesh that he needed to get rid of, that he needed to burn. And I believe God gave him the strength and the grace and the forgiveness that set Paul free. Even though Paul was in chains most of his ministry, he didn't think he was in chains because he knew his freedom was in Christ. And so that was the biggest criticism of Jesus, that he hung out with sinners. It wasn't a rumor. It was the truth. Jesus' critics had plenty of proof, just like in today's scripture lesson. Jesus liked to hang out with sinners. He did. And this story around a man named Zacchaeus proves that. I just told you he was the chief tax collector, the main man in Jericho when it came to taxes. And people just did not like him. Our Bible passage says that Zacchaeus was wealthy, so it's likely that he was profiting off the exploitation and the oppression of his people, of his neighbors. I guess that's how he earned the title, the least popular guy in Jericho. And I think that explains why Zacchaeus didn't want to see Jesus. Now, we all think, yeah, he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to get up in the sycamore tree so he could see Jesus. The Bible verses tell us that Zacchaeus ran ahead of the crowd. It's reasonable to assume he could have gotten close enough to talk to Jesus or touch him. Instead, he climbs up this sycamore fig tree. He wanted to see Jesus, but I don't think he wanted Jesus to see him. And there are a lot of people who feel that they are unacceptable to God. And some of you feel that way this morning. Some of you are watching. You feel that you're unacceptable to God. You feel like, I've just done too many terrible things. I'm doing terrible things right now, and I'm not acceptable to God. He can't receive me. I can't be loved like everybody else who has it together. I will tell you this. People who seem like they have it the most together are the ones that are falling apart, folks. They're barely holding it together. So be careful when you see someone strutting and seeming like they're arrogant and have it all together. They probably have a lot of stuff they're suffering with in silence going on, and they don't want you to know. And that's Zacchaeus. He's struggling, just like so many people feel. I'm unacceptable, but I'm going to go climb up this tree because I want to see this miracle worker, this holy man I keep hearing about who hangs out with sinners like me. So that's the first insight we get from the story. There are a lot of people who feel that they're unacceptable to God. There are many people who feel that they just cannot measure up. Maybe you feel that way. You come to church searching for something, but you're afraid to commit to anything. You're afraid to let anyone get to know you. You're afraid someone will discover that you are not a real Christian. These testimonies that these men shared over the last six weeks, my jaw hit the ground. And I'm thankful that they shared their testimonies because I respect them even more now 
I love them even more now. And I think our men relate to each other more because we all see ourselves as broken and frail, fragile, as they say. And we identify. And when we tell our story and when we share our wounds with others, our wounds can provide healing. And just from sharing those wounds and telling our story, God provides us healing if you get my drift and what I'm trying to say to you here. And so maybe you do feel that way. I'm, I'm not as good as the people in that church. And there are a lot of people on the outside, especially outside these church walls, who feel that way. I can't tell you how many people came last night. It was more than I could count. But how many of those people feel acceptable to God? They won't come into these doors, but they'll come and bring their kids to trunk or treat and get some candy and some home-cooked in the crock pot jambalaya. Now you wish you came. See what you missed? And there was a dessert extravaganza, all homemade fudge and chocolate and white chocolate dipped pretzels. It was, oh my gosh, it was unbelievable. But how many of those people were hurting? And I will tell you this, dozens upon dozens of people said, People are so friendly here. People are so loving here. All this is free? We talked to several people, handed them out cards and other things about the church. And they said, are the people of the church like this? I said, this is the church. And I pointed around to everybody that was there because all ages were there. So many of you came and helped and set up your trunks. And it was a beautiful thing to watch. I said, this is, this is God's church out here. And one lady said, she says, all these people? She said, but there's a lot of different people here. I said, yeah, and you know what? It's a foretaste of heaven. Yes. It's a foretaste of heaven. Aren't you glad you come to a church where it doesn't matter what you wear, what you look like, where you come from, what side of the tracks, what high school, what college you pull for? Some of you are rejoicing for the college you pulled for yesterday. Others are in severe depression right now. <laughs> so I hope somehow, some way, you'll come out of the, the, the depths of despair this morning and hear what God has to say that life is so much bigger than any football game or any other athletic event. And I've learned that, folks. So, people think they have gone too far away from God. The real tragedy is someone in their life may have told them that. You're never going to make it. You're not good enough. You're not fast enough. You're not tall enough. You're not smart enough. You don't go to the right school. You don't have the grades you don't look the part. One of the most destructive lies, lies we can believe about ourselves is, I'm not worthy of God's love. I'm not worthy of God's love. I want you to hear the remainder of this message from your heart. In the early days of the AIDS crisis, and I was around, many of you were around during the early days of the AIDS crisis, back in the 80s and early 90s. One evening, a man showed up at a church door. It was an Episcopal church. And the Reverend Ted Karp was the pastor. He was an Episcopal priest. And this man came before him. And the man's face bore the characteristic sores of an age-related cancer. He had a question for Reverend Ted. Will you allow me to come to your church and die here? He had already visited six other churches that night. All had turned him away. Reverend Ted hesitated. Like many people, he was afraid. Not much was known about the disease at this stage, and fear was driving a lot of hateful behavior. AIDS patients were losing their jobs, getting kicked out of their churches, facing harassment and death threats. But then Reverend Ted remembered Jesus' love for lepers, the sick, sick, tax collectors, and all those who were unacceptable in this society and in their society. And he discovered later that this man's plan was to commit suicide in the church, to die in a peaceful and beautiful place. But the man was so moved by Reverend Ted's acceptance that he changed his mind. Nobody really thought the Reverend would allow this man to come into the church. Elders of the church met about it and says, if he does, we're leaving. But he did. Not everybody in the church accepted this man. Attendance dropped drastically. But when the dust settled, 21 members of the 200-member congregation remained, and they remained with this man until his death. He died knowing that he was accepted by a community and surrounded by the love of God. And by the way, none of those people got AIDS from him, from sitting on the toilet or washing their hands in the same sink or drinking from the same, you know, gallon of tea, pouring it out, not drinking it out of there, you know, but pouring it, whatever. And that brings me to the second insight we get from today's Bible passage. 
One of the greatest truths Jesus came to teach us is that God loves you anyway. Can you imagine how that man felt? How loved he felt by that pastor and those 22 people who decided to stay? I don't know what happened in that church. There's no more on the story. But I believe God probably cured that church somewhere they would have never gone before because of their obedience and trusting in him to care for this man. You know, as we become more and more diverse as a church, the hope and love we have needs to be grounded in Christ. Not our political party, not our opinions. This is apparent, this is especially true and relevant as the elections approach. Not to let political parties and differing opinions cause us to be so divided, cause us to say hateful things and turn people away. God loves you no matter what. And he calls us to love regardless. It, it's empirical, which means it's a must-do. It's not a declarative. It's not something optional. We must love and not hate and not despise. Agree to disagree. Get to know the person's point of view. Talk to each other. Communicate with one another. Let me say this to you. No matter what you've done, no matter un how unacceptable you may feel, God loves you anyway. And God loves the other political party just as much as he loves your political party. He may not love what's being done, what's being said, and how things are being handled, which I would be really honest with you, I could really preach on that this morning, but I'm not. Because God is not leading me there whatsoever. You may want him to. Come on, Stephen, what do you really feel? What do you want to say? I'm not going to get involved in that. Because today's message is about this. Oh, how he loves you and me. That's the message today. You see how Jesus treats people? You see how he treats the, the ones that are considered nobodies and outsiders? He's showing us a picture of what God would do if he were to walk into our lives, our hearts may condemn us. Others may reject us, but God loves us anyway. And Zacchaeus was about to discover that in the most surprising way. Starting with verse 5, we, we read, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner? He's hanging out with, with Zacchaeus? Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? Remember, Jesus is surrounded by a crowd. He could have used this moment to preach a rousing sermon or perform a, form, a few healings or challenge the local religious leaders to a debate. At least he could have done something to help his reputation. But no, he does the exact opposite. Jesus uses this moment to show the least popular guy in Jericho love. That's what he does. Because Jesus never passed up an opportunity to show people the heart of God. He never passed that up. Even in his anger, he showed people the heart of God. And remember, no matter how unacceptable we feel, God loves us anyway. Writer Katie McCabe described her mentor, a man named Charles Savage, as a man who changed a room simply by walking into it. She says, he believed so completely in his many students and colleagues that we had no choice but to believe in ourselves. Inspired by her mentor, McCabe wrote that even 15 years after she studied under Savage, everything she did was an attempt to find the person he saw in her. I think, no, I believe. That's how Zacchaeus spent the rest of his life, trying to be the person Jesus saw in him. The love of God changes lives. It always has. It always will. A person exposed to grace, the unconditional, unearned, undeserved love of God will be changed by it. So when Zacchaeus is confronted by grace in the form of Jesus Christ, we shouldn't be surprised by the transformation in his life. Let's return to our lesson, beginning with verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. And Jesus said, Today 
salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That brings me to the final insight we get from today's story. Take a deep breath. And for this, I'm going to steal Jesus' very words. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. There it is. Please memorize these words. Inscribe them in your brain, in your heart, in all the dark places where you believe you are unacceptable to, to God. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. To seek and save. We need both these verbs to understand God's love. What if this verse read, For the Son of Man came to seek the lost. It would be so easy for us to misunderstand God's character and purpose. We might believe Jesus seeks the lost so he can correct them, condemn them, stand them in judgment, use them as an object lesson for a fire and brimstone seminar on 10 ways not to end up as the least popular guy in Jericho. Or what if we read this verse like this? For the Son of Man came to save the lost. That sounds better, but it still doesn't show us God's character and purposes. We could still twist Jesus' words to mean he saves the lost if they walk in our church doors, if they are compliant and make it easy for us, if they fit into our religious traditions, if they meet us halfway, if they believe what we believe and vote the way that we vote. That's not what Jesus did. It's not what Jesus meant. Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's what he said. That's what he meant. That's what he did. And that's what he wants his followers to do also. A few years ago, I was interning as a chaplain at Hamilton Medical Center in Dalton, Georgia. And um, I was with my supervisor, and we were making our rounds, and I had the um, chaplain on call phone with me, and it goes off all the time. It was going off. And it just so happened it was Ash Wednesday. And we weren't even considering doing anything about Ash Wednesday in, in this particular hospital. And the message was the patient and family in room so-and-so would like the imposition of the ashes. And I look at my supervisor, and I'm like, uh, we don't have any ashes. He looks at me and he says, you do what God prompts you to do. This is you. It's part of my training, I guess. And um, so I remembered we had this little um, tin can up in the, uh, the chaplain's office. And so I went and got it. And I got some paper. And I, I burned it in that tin can by myself burning in there in the hospital you're not supposed to do that you know there's oxygen everything going on I would catch people in the hospital elevators all the time vaping and smoking all the time it happens even in the hospitals around here don't tell anybody and so um, I go up to this room and the pressure is mounting because my supervisor who I respect like nobody's business he decides he's gonna he's gonna observe me I'm like oh thank you so we walk up there, and we go into the room, and it's a 19-year-old girl in the bed. Her eyes are wide open, but she's lifeless. Some breathing machines. Her mom and dad are there. The mama says, we're, we're Catholic. I said, okay. And I said, well, I got a request that you desired. I didn't even say imposition of ashes. That you wanted to receive ashes today on Ash Wednesday. And she said, Yes, we do. And my daughter. And so I won't go through all the liturgy that I went through. And it was, a, it was a, a summary of it because they knew what it represented. And I put the ashes on the forehead of the daughter first. Her eyes looking right at me, but again, lifeless. At least that's what I thought. And I put the ashes on the forehead of the mama. And I went to put it on the dad, and he turned. He says, no, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. 
I said, excuse me? He says, I can't fix my daughter. I can't do anything. I've always been able to fix everything, but I can't fix her. And I feel alone. I don't know what to do. And I just, I just hugged him. And he, he wept. My supervisor standing over the corner. I could care less what he was thinking at this point. Because he wouldn't have probably done that. Hippo laws, all that kind of stuff. And I said, your brokenness, your unworthiness makes you all the more ready to receive God's grace in these ashes today. I said, he loves you. He loves you so much. And I just met you and I love you. And I know you can't fix everything, but you know who can? The one that you and I love and serve, Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, he had kind of long hair. He pulled his hair back and he poked his forehead out. Made the sign of the cross. And I said, from dust you came and dust you shall return. He's forgiven you. He set you free. And he loves you. Now, I left out of that room. And the door was open. And half the nurses from the nurse's station were standing in the doorway, watching what was going on. And they started blowing their hair back. They wanted to receive the ashes. And I blessed every one of them. I said a blessing over them of forgiveness and grace and love and thanked them for what they do. And all their busyness, all of a sudden the staff started coming down the hall. Well, it got through the hospital that this was happening. We were getting requests on the phone, text messages. I'm taking the bowl around everywhere. I'm going into patients' rooms. People in the ICU. This is before COVID now. Down in the ER, the hustle and bustle is crazy down there. I'm making the sign of the cross on their foreheads, and I'm praying for them. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? Almost as crazy as inviting yourself to the home of the least popular guy in Jericho. Jericho, And yet people stopped in their busyness, even in the ER, and they received the sign of the cross in ashes. They asked and they received prayer. They talked about their faith and their struggles on their rejection of God. But they stopped and they talked. And I hugged more people that day than I think I've ever hugged in my life. I felt like Doug, the greatest hugger of all times. Just kept hugging and hugging and hugging and putting ashes. My finger was worn out. I had to switch hands a couple of times. Karen, you know what that's like, don't you? That shoulder having to learn to use your left hand. It got worn out. But God gave me supernatural strength to continue for several hours. It turns out. A lot of people who never go inside a church are still looking for God, even in the hospital. So many people were touched that day. And this was not about me, but I, had, I made a connection with what we call the interdisciplinary staff or team, even the administration that day, that I would have never made before. And I had such reluctance in the beginning to go and do what God wanted me to do. So many people were touched Somebody even said, never before have we had a church come to us. Or we couldn't make it to church. And you brought church to us today. Couldn't make it to the Ash Wednesday service this morning because of my shift. But you brought the Ash Wednesday service to us. And what I didn't tell you is what that dad of that 19-year-old girl said. He said, thank you for bringing God to us today. That's what I do every Sunday, folks. That's what I do every day of my life is to bring God to you. And that's what he's called you to do. And you're going to receive some criticism for it, like Jesus. Be ready for it. You bring God to us. That was Jesus' mission. Please don't believe the lie that you're unacceptable to God. One of the greatest truths Jesus came to teach us is that God loves you anyway. You can say that to the person that says, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I can't fix this. You know what, sir, ma'am, honey, daughter, God loves you 
anyway. Daddy has screwed up. Mama has made some mistakes. And we love you. And we know you have too. But we love you anyway. You may not be exactly like us. You may not believe exactly like us. You may des- decide a different whole career than we want you to. But we love you anyway. And we will follow you and accept you who God created you to be. No matter what you're feeling, no matter what others say, no matter whether you deserve it or not, God loves you anyway. That's the whole reason God became flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. If you're looking for Jesus, and even if you're not, I guarantee you, Jesus is looking for you. And he will not stop pursuing you and chasing after you. Because his is a reckless love. He'll do anything. He'll even go to the cross and shed his own blood for you to prove to you how much he loves you. And if you have received the love of God through Jesus Christ, then someone is waiting for you, looking for you to share the love and hope of Jesus and change their life too. If you get nothing else today from this message or for this service, do what Lisa and that team from Ecuador did. Show them the love of Jesus and use words when necessary and let them know, oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves you and me. And he's going to keep pursuing you at all cost. So why keep making it so hard and difficult? Why not just go ahead and surrender right now? Let's do it. Come on. Do it with me. Pray with me. Lord, I surrender. I surrender all to you. I need you. I can't do this without you. People depend on me. I'm tired. I'm weak. And I'm worn. But you are more than enough. Because you love me. And that's all I need. And I want to love like you, Jesus. I want to extend a hand to the Zacchaeuses of the world, Lord. And welcome them into your kingdom, Lord. Into your presence, Lord. So forgive me for being selfish. Lord, help me to have some unpublished thoughts. Because sometimes, let me be honest, a lot of the times, I speak before consulting with you. Speak through me. Love through me. Transform me, Lord, to be like Jesus. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father God, as always, thank you for your presence here today at Misty Creek. We are humbled and truly blessed. Church, as we leave here today, let us never forget that God loves us just the way we are. Our flaws are not flaws in his eyes. No matter what we have done, he loves us and always will. After all, he made us, he created us, he breathed life into each and every one of us. And to top it all off, he gave us unconditional, everlasting love. No matter how far we think we might be from God and his grace, know that he is right beside you, in front of you, and behind you. His love surrounds us. Church, let that comfort fill your hearts. Go forth and share the good news with others. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Love you guys. Peace be with you.